In 1991, 22 CNA field reps deployed to the Middle East to support Operation Desert Storm. These are their stories. Welcome to Analysis in Combat. I'm John Stimson. This week, the story of two CNA analysts who were assigned to command ships during Desert Storm. Robert Ward, stationed aboard USS John F. Kennedy, the flagship of the Red Sea Battle Force, commanded by Rear Admiral Mixon. And Steve Carpey, stationed aboard USS America, the flagship of Cruiser Destroyer Group 2, commanded by Rear Admiral Katz. Robert and Steve lived and worked alongside sailors and analyzed Navy operations in real time. On this episode of Analysis in Combat, you'll hear about their research and the moment they realized it would impact the course of the conflict. So why don't you start off by introducing yourself and telling me what your role was in Desert Storm? Yeah, I'm Robert Ward. I'm a part-time member of the CNA staff now. Back in 1990, I got word I was going to be a augmentee to the John F. Kennedy battle group in the Red Sea. I flew out first week of January 1991. It was just right on the beginning of everyone was on edge of whether the war was going to start or not, whether the Iraqis would evacuate Kuwait. So the threat is very high that on, on board the ship there'd been information that there would probably, if, if the Iraqis decided they weren't going to evacuate, they would probably do a a preemptive strike on the battle group. So threats were very high. When I got there the first week of January, I flew up to the carrier. When we arrived, we were met by armed guards searching all all of us, bodily searching us and searching our luggage before we were allowed to come into the the island on the carrier. So the threats were very high. That must have made it feel very real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we did. And then uh, within a day, a few days later, that was the first first week of January. And within a few days, it, it became pretty clear that the uh, Iraqis were not going to pull out of Kuwait. So the the admiral decided to set condition zebra, which means he locks up the ship, closes all the hatches, makes it watertight, airtight. It was a you know, a, a great concern about the uh, gas attack on the ship too. So we all had to take our, our our shots while we were there. Yeah. So after I after I got on the ship, I of course the ship was the the U, uh, USS John F Kennedy. It was a carrier CB sixty seven. Uh, and the admiral aboard was Riley Mixon. We were Admiral Riley Mixon. He was a carrier, a commander of carrier group. Who he also at that time was commander of the Red Sea Battle Force, which ended up being three carrier strike groups at the beginning of the war. But I remember that that some of the uh, more senior uh, officers on the air wing when when I arrived, that was really excited them because they thought, and they said this that you know when you when you see the CNA guy show up out here, you know that means it's really going to happen. <laughs> My name is Steve Carpey, and I'm in the Ops Division at CNA. My job title is Senior Research Scientist. Great, Steve. Thanks for talking to me today. So you were deployed with Desert Storm? Yes, that's correct. And what was your title at the time? Well, I was also on the research staff. I was in uh, what was the Advanced Technology Division, but I became CNA's field rep to Carrier Strike Group 2. And in those days, it was known as Cruiser Destroyer Group 2. And for those of us who have never lived aboard a Navy warship, can you just tell us a little bit about, like, what's the experience like? Well, the ships, aircraft carriers or destroyers, this being an aircraft carrier, it's a kind of a tough, I would say, experience in the sense of it's an austere environment. Everything is metal, really. Uh, when you're in the Admiral's mess in his dining area, 
that's actually pleasant. You have nice furniture and the tables are ni nice. But other than that, the sleeping quarters and also the working spaces are metal. But the noise, really the noise was the biggest thing that if, if it's your first time on an aircraft carrier, it's the flight operations are very noisy. You have jet engines. If you're on the Admiral staff, it's it's an honor to be on the Admiral staff as I was, but your sleeping quarters and also your uh, working spaces are one deck immediately below the flight deck. And so it's just all the noise that you eventually get used to it. I think it did affect my hearing, that my hearing's not as, I think, as good as it otherwise would be. On January 16, 1991, just before the start of the conflict, USS America joined the Red Sea Battle Group. Steve accompanied America's command staff to Kennedy, where he met Robert. I was really surprised to see Steve there. I didn't know he was coming over. I remember going back to the uh, the meeting was in a, a ready room. Admiral Mixon was going to lay out the uh, master attack plan that had been worked out over the previous several months, but he was going to bring it to the just the staff that Steve was on who came in on the America. And I was going to sit in on it because I hadn't been on the ship all that time either. I think we sat together and then it was also interesting. That's where we first learned that this thing was really going to, really going to happen. So you guys were together then when it became clear that there would be an outbreak of hostilities. And so I imagine that this would affect, you know, the, the vibe and the feeling throughout the whole carrier strike group. Was it anticipation? Was it nervousness? Like, what was the feeling when it became clear that this was going to happen and there was really going to be an outbreak of hostilities? Steve? Well, yeah, John, thank you. So for both of you, I looked at my field letters yesterday, all three of them, and I was able, I did a little searching and read through all three of those field letters from that time period. And, and so, Bob, you'll remember now, you and I were sitting next to each other, and we were in that ready room, and we were listening to Admiral Mixon present this overview of the plans that had been put together, but there was no execute order. So we're just sitting there listening, and nobody knew if any actual hostile combat would take place. And while we're sitting there, a radio man came into the room and handed this reading sheet to the admiral, the admiral read it, and then he said, this is it, we're going to war. And the room, I going from memory, we were all like, wow. And it, it just, it was a big deal. And I, I think, and Bob, ho hopefully you can help uh, shed light on this. I think the admiral kind of ended the briefing at that point. I don't remember a lot of further briefing. I think it was at that point that we needed to spin up and start moving toward execution. Is, is that your memory? Yeah, I think so. I think he went out and uh, got on the one MC on the ship and told everybody on the ship that he'd gotten the execution order. And we're, we, you know, we're we're really serious now, and we're going to probably going to be launching tonight. So that it was a real thing at that moment. Right, and ba based on my field letter the applicable one, the execution started um, around, I think it was around 1.30 in the morning local time, which meaning that's when launches of various U.S. assets started launching around 1.30 in the morning, which was only a handful of hours into the future. That's about right. I remember it was certainly we stayed up all night that night. I I was assigned to work in the strike cell. It was my office essentially, and but during the launch, I, I, I was able to go up to the tower and watch the launch from up there. To actually watch the airplanes take off, and I was absolutely amazed at how many airplanes were in that first wave going, launching. Right. And this early phase of the war was one of the Navy's largest contributions to the overall effort. Talk to me a little bit about the scale of that. You know, there's the amount of airplanes in the air all at the same time. And in, in addition to the ordinance that was supporting the ground invasion. Well, my recollection is that it was dozens of aircraft involved in that first strike and that the way it was described, 
when I attended the debriefs, and now I'm speaking in general here, the debriefs that I attended when the aircraft had recovered, that there were so many aircraft inbound with the lights turned on prior to entering into Iraqi airspace that the sky was lit up with U.S. aircraft. Everyone was expecting a pretty high attrition rate based on various intelligent uh, inputs and various models runs. So we were just really had our fingers crossed on how many of these airplanes we're seeing going out would actually be coming back. And when they did recover, you know, hours and hours later, we were so excited because, you know, they were all there. And that the, the air crews were jubilant because they had survived. And, you know, I, I went to their debriefs and they were talking about the sky being lit up like the mall on the 4th of July with AAA gunfire and the SAMs flying at them. Back on USS America, new precautions made it clear that the ship was now in an active war zone. We were issued gas masks, and I think that would be a surprise even to today's research staff at CNA who deploy, because I think it's unusual. To my knowledge, gas masks have not been issued to at-sea personnel subsequent to Desert Storm. So I'm pretty sure that Bob Ward and Tim Carroll and uh, everyone else, there were seven CNA field reps on the six aircraft carriers. And the reason was that there was a indications that the Iraqis may use chemical weapons. They had used them against Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. And so that's that's why we had those. Wow. So, you know, this is just really shows how like our, you know, people think about field, you know, anal military analysts, you know, in the offices, far from conflict. But this really is like you were you in a situation where it was possible that you were going to undergo chemical fire. Yeah, that's right. And and it turned out mines as well. The Iraqis had let loose sea mines um, and the way sea mines are normally used is they're moored so they don't just float around, but some of these were just floating around. Huh. I'm pretty sure the interpretation at the time was the Iraqis had done that on purpose, just let them flow free. And so, yeah, I remember seeing myself a, a sea mine. Of course, the ship's crew knew it was there, and we were, of course, avoiding the sea mine, but you could see it. You could see the sea mine floating by. And so, yeah, it was the exercises, yes, but this was different. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Bill Rosenau, host of CNA's monthly podcast, Coming In From The Cold. Every month we tell a forgotten or never remembered story from the Cold War and explore how it affects national security today. New episodes are released on the last day of each month. You can find Coming In From The Cold on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Both Robert and Steve worked on projects that directly impacted command decisions. For Steve, one of those projects was researching the Iraqi Scud missile arsenal. I asked Steve to briefly summarize Scud missiles and how they were used during the Gulf War. Okay, a Scud missile is a short-range ballistic missile. Going from memory, the Iraqis had created at least, I think some of these missiles were their own domestic version. The more general version, again, from memory, was that this was a, a Russian missile originally. It's not unusual for a weapon system to have an original version and then domestic versions that are created by whatever country in question. And my memory is that these were domestic versions that the Iraqis had manufactured. Uh -huh. And the range was long enough to reach from Iraq into the cities in Israel, as well as pretty major cities in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And so that missile was capable of reaching Tel Aviv, Haifa. It was also capable of reaching Riyadh. And it was in the news at the time. Israeli news stations and 
I presume, I, you know, going from memory here, I think CNN was broadcasting even back in those days. And you would see these missiles coming in as, as photographed by news crews. In any case, that was the missile. And the Iraqis were pretty proficient at launching these things in the sense that they launched dozens of them. I can't remember the total count, but it was it was up in like the 80, 90, maybe even more uh, were launched over a span of several weeks. Hmm, wow. And it sounds like if they were targeting cities with these, then they were a threat not only to military personnel, but also to civilians. Yes, that's correct. It would be interesting to look back uh, and, and, and just take a look of how many civilian casualties there were. Another was one that um, hit the city of Dharan in Saudi Arabia. And when I say the city, what it actually hit was a barracks, an army barracks there, and a horrible outcome that uh, apparently the, the hit was a direct enough hit that it ended up kill, killing a couple dozen of the army, U.S. Army soldiers. And so that that was a the biggest American set of casualties from Scud missiles. And what was your research like? USS America was in the the northern Red Sea for a couple of weeks. I think it was ten to fourteen days in early January. And then we moved around into the Persian Gulf. And so I had different analytical efforts I was working on at different times, depending on where we were. I did start looking at the Scud missile. I was tracking Scud missile launches and impacts. And it seemed like something that, because it was quantitative, it was something I could analyze pretty easily. How did you go about doing this? There was adequate intelligence information that documented the launches. And so that's what I was tracking. There was also estimates of impact locations. And some of those impact location estimates, I believe, based on all source information. And that term is a technical term. It just means that every available piece of information. And some of that, of course, would be just the civilian reporting, you know, whether it's the government of Israel or the government of Saudi Arabia reporting where the impacts were. But it was a combination of multiple sources for the impact locations. The launch locations, it was the U.S. intelligence information. And so the times of those launches and the launch where they were launched from and the impact locations. And so I was tracking all of that and correlating the information, correlating it. And I kept track of the dates, of course, date and time of day. So that's what I was compiling. And I was looking for patterns. I thought, hmm, there could be some patterns here. So that's what I was looking for. And sure enough, I did notice there were patterns. There were definitely some interesting patterns, both in terms of time of day. The Iraqis were launching during certain periods of, of the day and also the launch locations. There were some patterns there as well. And that was kind of a eureka moment when I noticed the patterns and I shared that. I was as you might imagine, I was kind of excited about that. I thought that was pretty noteworthy. And so I shared it with um, the Admiral's intelligence officer, and he agreed. He thought this was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And what did the officer do with that information? Well, my memory is that he wrote up a, a nice summary of it and sent it out as an intelligence summary. And it was my naval message, as I recall. And again, you know, I'm going from memory here, and I think he ran it by me. So he wrote that up and sent it out to, as I recall, to the other aircraft carrier battle groups. And so that was helped to use to like help pick targets to counter this Scud missile aggression then. Is that correct? Uh, ultimately, yes. Exactly. It, the idea was that the carrier air wings on those six aircraft carriers, as well as the U.S. Air Force, of course, who were flying out of air bases in Saudi Arabia, 
for the most part. But the Joint Air Force, composed of Navy and Air Force and Marine Corps, that they could then uh, take advantage of that information. And my recollection, just looking back on it, is that indeed the aircraft carriers that were in the North Red Sea actually were uh, tasked to, um, it was called scud hunting. And the, those scud hunting sorties, the idea was to try to drop ordnance on, the, they're called TELs, the, the mobile launchers, uh, try to drop ordnance on those mobile launchers. And so knowing where the launch sites were and the patterns of those launch sites, that was helpful. Because again, mobile being an important word, those launchers were mobile. And the way the Iraqis did it, they had experience because of the Iran-Iraq war. They were not foolish. They were moving those launchers around, which is just common sense, of course. So the scud hunting missions were, to a large degree, were flown from the Red Sea. I think there may have been some of them that were also flown from the Persian Gulf. The purpose of those uh, so-called scud hunting was to go and, and try to drop ordnance on the, uh, the scud launchers. Hmm. Understood. That really shows the impact of where this research was taken, that it was actually used to modify operations and target these specific sites. So you you have identified these patterns, it's modified target locations. And then like, what did this give you any like great insight into any like further intelligence about the Iraqi operations? Yes, it did. One of the things that the Admiral's intelligence officer and I noticed was that the launches were taking place from a, a geographic area, a pretty well-defined geographic area. And we understood what the Iraqis were doing. Nobody predicted this, at least not to my knowledge and not to the knowledge of the N2, the intelligence officer. Nobody had predicted it ahead of time, but it all made sense when we saw this pattern. And so the geographic area you know, in one dimension, it was fairly extended, but in the other dimension, not so much. So kind of a rectangle. And what we ended up discovering was that there was a kind of a bunker facility. It was something that the Iraqis had partially put underground. It stuck up a little bit out of the ground, but they had covered it with, with earth. And it was through photography that uh, you could see this facility. Uh, and because of its location near where the launches were taking place from, it attracted our attention. And I think I was the one who actually noticed it first. So it was in pre-existing photography, but it caught my attention. And it turned out that it had been identified, but misidentified originally. That, that's my memory, that it was not out of the blue. It was known that it existed, but just that it was not considered um, to be associated with SCUD activity. Mm -hmm. What we were able to learn is that it, it, it definitely, eventually, we came to believe that it was pretty firmly that it was uh, associated with the SCUD activity, with the uh, SCUD missile launchers. Uh, is there anything else that we haven't covered on SCUD that you'd like to? Well, John, the way it was... It was exciting be in a few different angles. One was that it, it mattered, and the, the aircraft carrier groups that were in the Red Sea, this was a big part of what they were tasked to do. USS America left there, I think it was around the two-week point, but we were still, even though we had left and gone into the Persian Gulf, those other two carriers were still carrying out scud hunting operations. And so it was something that the Navy had been tasked to, uh, a mission they had been tasked to do. And it was also considered politically important, the Israelis and the Saudis, but I would say even more so the Israelis. It was a big deal for them. Aboard Kennedy, Robert worked on a variety of projects for the command. He tells me that he was working 24-7. My concerns were with the rest of the Red Sea Battle Force. There were two other carriers there. So I was working 
to provide an analysis to the Admiral on how the entire battle force was effective in this week. In the first week of the war, it was pretty much around the clock operation. Mm -hmm. But then as the time went on, we found that we had to sleep occasionally. So we ended up working each shift. We did a lot of problems of the day when the Admiral would ask a question, we would try to provide him a very quick answer. Some of the problems required a little bit more work. One of them was, there was a great concern about attrition of airplanes. The models that had been run for the Air Force before the war predicted that Saddam's integrated air defense system would be very lethal and there would be a major loss of airplanes. So everyone was concerned about the loss of airplanes. You would lose airplanes to anti-aircraft artillery. You could lose airplanes to SAM, Service Air Missiles. We had two types of airplanes on the Kennedy, the A-6 medium attack intruder and the A-7 light attack Corsair. The intruder had capability for laser designation of targets to deliver laser guided bombs. Its preferred tactic was to fly in very low under the radar, deliver accurately at night on target. It turns out that after the first week or so, there were several A6s lost to the Navy. Uh, it was clear that they, the A6 was going to have to go to altitude. As the A7s were at altitude, the A7s didn't have a laser to, for the most part. So there was an accuracy problem we worked on. There was the lethality of the airplanes. We were concerned about one of the problems that came up early in the war was that there were lots of missiles in the air. Typically, in those days, the type of missiles that were used but in Saddam's integrated air defense system were Vietnam-era Soviet missiles. And so there was tactics to defeat them if the air crew could see them coming. So there was a thing called a radar threat warning receiver that would allow you to know if a missile has been launched at you and whether it was guiding on you. That allowed you to take the maneuvers to defeat the missile. One of the problems that came up was that not all the missiles were triggering the warning system. We went through an analysis of why that was taking place. At first, it was thought that the, a new generation of signals for the missile had been implemented that we wouldn't be able to actually acquire. But the funny thing was that some of the air crews were receiving signals, others weren't. So we tried to correlate who was and who wasn't getting it with the equipment on the airplane. Finally found out after a great deal of cross correlation that it really got down to the tactics the enemy was using. And sometimes they weren't attaching the signals to the, the flight of the missile, which undoubtedly reduced the effectiveness of the missile to essentially zero. But that, that was presumably in fear of the anti-radiation missiles that were used by the air crew in retaliation against the SAM sites. So let's get into a bit of the uh, subcategories here for strike warfare. There's the uh, mechanical element, and I believe that has to do with like the effectiveness of the weapons generally. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, when you attack a target, afterwards there is a function called battle damage assessment, which other uh, information is gathered through other means to determine whether that target was suffered the level of degradation that you intended for it to be. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. If it didn't, then the question is why not? And so maybe the reason is that you didn't hit the target. In that case, obviously you didn't destroy it. But if other indications were that you did hit the target, but you didn't get the level of effectiveness you wanted, then there was some other problem. And this is kind of the dud weapons problem. These are weapons that actually we found out did hit the target, but didn't either explode or didn't explode at the level of, that they should have. So we tried to correlate why this was happening. What are the reasons for dud weapons? It could be the, the weapon itself is, is no good, or the lot that lot of weapons are no good, or the fuse is no good or it was installed improperly onto the weapon when the weapon was 
build up or the weapon wasn't wired properly onto the airplane or the fuse wasn't set properly by the air crew. There were so many components to it. And what we tried to do was look at all these components and see which ones repeated themselves so that we could find out which is the dominant cause of the dead weapons. This kind of analysis on how this kind of, on, on the failure of these weapons or the success, was it used to adapt in real time during Desert Storm or did it really come into play after the conflict ended? And no, like for is, future conflicts? Real time, I guess, mm -hmm. absolutely real time. What it does is give the commander, the on-scene commander, a better view of the options that are available to him and mm -hmm. the political uh, assessment of what these options might, how they might play out. Should he spend his effort to get a new lot of bombs? Should he get a new lot of fuses? Or should he get a better training for the ordnance guy that built the bomb? Or how do you approach this? And which is the dominant factor? That's where you should put, put your effort. And right. So essentially, it's a question of resource allocation, right? Like, this, you know, we can spend all the time in the world buying new bombs. But if if the operators aren't trained properly to, you know, target them correctly, you're not going to really fix the problem. That's right. Um, and that's why it's so important to have objective third party personnel involved in these analysis who, you know, don't have a pre-existing stake in the strategy that the military may have come up with, right? If the military was invested in the idea that, just to give an example, more ordinance equals more effectiveness, then they may go down that, that path of choosing more ordinance. But by bringing in outside academic observers like yourself, they're able to actually see where is the problem coming from and adjust accordingly. I think that's right. USS America was one of several diesel-powered carriers that deployed during Desert Storm. This model was being phased out of the fleet in favor of nuclear-powered ships. Navy personnel took to the skies to capture one of the last times these historic American vessels would face combat together. That was a kind of a fun day that we did. It was when the hostilities had been winding down and all four of the carriers went into formation. And I looked at the photo. Those photos are available on the internet. I just looked at that earlier today. And it was kind of neat. And it was USS Midway is the oldest of, of those four carriers. And you can see in that photo that Midway is smaller than the others. I think Ranger is then the second smallest because it was actually older than USS America. And then you had America and Roosevelt. And I think it was a helicopter that took the photos. That was a fun day. Very cool. Very cool. And we can certainly make those photos available uh, in the show notes for listeners. So being on the deck during that, did you get the sense of the scale of what this was actually going to look like? Or did it really like click once you actually stepped back and saw the picture in its full scale? We had a pretty good sense because ships simply don't operate that close to each other. U.S. Navy warships, it's just not how we operate. So a typical separation would be more like a close ship would be maybe five miles away. This was much closer than that. I think I was up in the, the flag bridge at the time because I remember I could see the other. I don't remember if I could easily see the other three or just one of them, but I'm pretty sure I was up in the flag bridge, which means you're up elevated in in what's called the island. It's the part of the ship that sticks up from the, the flight deck. And uh, the Admiral has his own um, space up there. I'm pretty sure I remember thinking, well, my colleagues are on those other ships. CNA analysts have worked alongside military personnel and informed the decisions of commanders from World War II to Desert Storm and beyond. Robert and Steve were awarded the Civilian Service Medal for these contributions and so many others, alongside their 20 CNA colleagues who also deployed with Desert Storm. Next time on Analysis and Combat, we'll cover CNA's work developing and implementing the Maritime Prepositioning Forces concept. See you then. Analysis and Combat is edited and produced by John Stimson with executive producer Don Burroughs. 
theme music is by Edward Granga. If you enjoy our show, we'd love if you could give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about us. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in two weeks.